Um, a very good uh, afternoon, uh, evening, morning, um, wherever you're calling in from, um, whatever the time of your day. Um, I'm going to um, um, to provide some information about my thoughts, as, as Bob sort of indicated, um, about the interface between conservation science and conservation practice. And um, I know I'm stepping in the um, uh, in the footsteps of some uh, some famous predecessors. The the last annual Dice Conference was um, uh, was given by uh, Dr. Jane Goodall, of course, a, a very well known uh, primatologist with a fantastic track record. I, I saw her only last year speaking in Singapore. I, I think she's ninety or ninety older than ninety. Um, she's an amazing amazing person. Um, and um, um, many of you who may have heard her speak know that um, she starts most of her talks with a, a chimpanzee call. And um, uh, logically, uh, I've worked on orangutans for the past 30 years. I would start my call uh, with an orangutan long call, which, which probably is one of the most uh, majestic sounds of the Asian tropical rainforest. Um, but I'm not going to do that because I'm actually really quite bad at that. Um, and it, it points in a direction um, of, of one of the things that I'm not. I've got, as Bob said, a, um, a background in, um, in tropical ecology. Oops, sorry. Let's go back. I'm just trying to minimize this window here. There you go. Um, I've got a background in, uh, in tropical ecology. Um, I, I started working in Indonesia in the early 1990s on the, um, the fascinating topic of the decay of deer dung and uh, the interplay with dung beetles and so on. But I quickly learned that I wasn't a real field biologist. I, I don't have the kind of brain that, that stores detail very well. I, I, I love bird watching. I'm very keen, I go out a lot, uh, but I'm very good at it. Um, I, I may see a bird uh, with a yellow wing patch and a, um, um, a red neck and I close my eyes and I can't remember whether the neck was yellow or red or the other way around. And um, um, similarly with, with bird calls, I do my best to remember them, but I'm not very good. And, and quickly I learned out that maybe my, my, my field wasn't going to be field biology because it takes a certain, a certain person to, to, to work in that field. You have to have a really good understanding of what is going on uh, in nature with species, how they interact with the environment and have that kind of um, uh, understanding of, of the species in its ecological environment. Um, so instead, I, I started working on, on conservation science, which is quite different from, um, from ecology. Uh, it deals with the broader problems of conservation. And what I'm going to talk about tonight is the, um, the armchair view of conservation science. And that's a little bit tongue in cheek, but I, I get a fair bit of heat on, tropical, uh, on the, uh, social media um, of people uh, accusing me of being a, um, uh, an ivory tower scientist who doesn't know anything about what's going on on the ground, an ar armchair scientist, um, or fake scientists, I've heard this one as well. And I wanted to talk a little bit um, about the importance of conservation science, also some of the pitfalls of conservation science, where uh, potentially we are less effective than we, we could or should be. And I'm going to explore that by uh, a parallel analysis. I'm, I'm going to talk about myself. I know myself pretty well. I know my background, but I'm also going to talk about someone else who operates here in the UK and has taken a very different path to conservation, much more focused on practice. I'll explain a little bit more about that later. So um, what we're going to do is, uh, I'm going to run through a couple of things. I've got about 40, 45 minutes and I'd love you to, to hang around and stay tuned in for, for that time. And I hope you, you're picking up bits and pieces of information that, uh, or thoughts that, that intrigue you and, uh, and, and make you think about your work and how you, how you wanna uh, achieve your conservation objectives. So first of all, I'm gonna make the strong point that conservation is never simple. Um, I'll keep it short, I'll explain what I mean with that. Uh, then, as I said, I'm going to explore these two different paths about uh, uh, of going about conservation, uh, conservation science and conservation practice, looking at hands-on conservation in the UK and conservation science on, on Borneo. Um, I'm going to reiterate the point, I'll get make, strongly make the point that I strongly believe that individual leadership is one of the key um, requirements to conservation success. And then sort of wrapping it up and making maybe taking it back to 
the aspiring conservation scientist among you to, to, to have some take home messages that might help you think about your, your career and how you go about your work. So about this simplicity, or rather um, about this complexity. Um, so you, you've probably often heard the, the, the term that something isn't rocket science. Uh, uh, sourdough, sourdough baking isn't rocket science. As if rocket science is a, an incredibly difficult and complex thing to achieve. Um, I guess at some stage, maybe in the 1950s, 1960s, when people first started to think of sending rockets into space and rockets to the moon, and that often went quite wrong. These challenges were formidable and, um, and hard to overcome. But nowadays, actually, rocket science is, is pretty simple. It has predictable mechanics. You send a rocket into space, it's, um, it, it, it's propelled, it, it's pro uh, propelled it's, um, it, it, it follows the laws of gravity. Uh, pretty predictable systems in a defined sort of area where you know you're operating, whether you're flying to the moon or Mars or into outer space, the system is quite well defined. And apart from a few loose screws and nuts and bolts, there really aren't that many uncertainties, which often means that the, high, the, the success rate is really high. Most of the rockets that are sent to space actually do really quite well. They do what they're supposed to do, um, and, and it's all pretty predictable. So rocket science is complex and it's complicated, but ultimately it's proven to be solvable. Now, conservation science, on the other hand, is an entirely different beast. I think we really don't understand many of the mechanisms in conservation. And that has to do with the fact that we don't really know what the boundaries of a system are, uh, what the system are that we're looking at. Are we, is the system that we're looking at or trying to work on um, an orangutan, uh, one orangutan that we're, we want to save, or is it that orangutan in its um, in the population where that orangutan came from, or is it that population within its natural forest habitat? So we need to then also focus on the protection of that forest, or is it that forest habitat, including the people that make use of the forest ecosystem services and the goods from that forest, or grow their um, their, have their gardens in that same piece of forest? Or is it larger? Is it about all the orangutan species? Or are they even global systems? Like, is it about biodiversity and global climate change? Whichever way you look, completely redefines how, how you address your particular problem. That means that often we're dealing with high uncertainty in conservation science and often with nonlinear interaction. So a, a small change somewhere can have a massive outcome somewhere else. Let's say a policy decision on a particular issue will end up um, making the conservation world look completely different from not having that policy decision in the first place. Um, this also relates to the fact that we often have what are called wicked problems. And wicked problems are problems that are really unsolvable because you start with a question, um, something simple, you, you find an answer, and as you're finding the answer, you're learning more about your problem, you start scratching your head and say, actually, my problem has changed. I need to redefine my question. And you start again. And as you develop and learn and learn and lo learn, the problem just keeps running away from you. And I think this is really typical about these complex conservation contexts in which we operate. They just keep, uh, they seem to keep running away from us as we're trying to solve their, um, their problem. And I think for that reason, we have um, an unknown or at least a very low success rate. Other, otherwise, I probably wouldn't be sitting here, I wouldn't have a job as a conservation scientist and practitioner. So um, conservation science is, is just like rocket science, complex and complicated, but possibly unsolvable. And um, it's been called by some conservation scientists, just ac accept that all we do is we're muddling through. We're trying to make the best of a situation, slowly moving to a better situation, but never quite getting there. Um, problematically, and I love this quote from, um, um, Henry Louis Mencken, um, uh, an American um, philosopher of previous century, or maybe even the century before that, I can't quite remember. But I love his quote saying that for every complex problem, there is an answer that is clear, simple, and wrong. And that goes back to what I was saying about um, this the, the unclarity, the lack of clarity in the boundaries of the system. Like you think you, you understand something, you have a question, you have an answer. So, Problem solved. No, 
that's probably the wrong answer. You, you need to redefine what you're talking about. So it's, um, it's an interesting thing. And it's a really important concept because the world in which we operate as conservation scientists and practitioner, uh, practitioners um, is just so complex because of this. Well, you have the ecological interaction, your ecological systems, but then you have the people that have fundamentally changed those systems that we are trying to work in uh, to the extent that geologists think that in the future, let's say a couple of uh, million years or tens of millions of, of years from now, you could come back to planet Earth and look at the geology, at the geological layers, and you will find a clearly defined distinct layer when humans were so dominant that we changed the entire chemical composition of, um, of, of the Earth in a way that can be identified far into the future, which is now called the Anthropocene, or has been proposed to be called the Anthropocene, just like we have the Pleistocene and the Pliocene and the Miocene, etc. And humans have uh, had an incredible impact on, on planet Earth. I, I just lifted three um, newspaper headlines that all related to papers that were published only last year. Uh, humans have just 0.01% of all life, but have destroyed 83% of wild mammals. People have shaped most of terrestrial nature for at least 12,000 years. Uh, and this one particularly, I find that quite mind blowing. Human made materials now outweigh Earth's entire biomass, which is really quite something. And in a way, I, I had my own kind of wow or aha moment um, sitting somewhere in, in that photo on the, on the left, uh, which is a beautiful area in a national park in the Western Italian Alps where we were a couple of summers ago on a summer holiday. And uh, we've been walking around and getting to know this. And it's a really exciting area. There's there's bear, a brown bear, there's wolves coming back into the area. Um, it's, it's really rich. And I remember sitting um, on the doorstep of an abandoned farmstead um, and um, um, sort of looking around and there was a, um, I think it was a spruce. It was, yeah, I'm, not, I'm also not a good botanist. Um, it was a spruce tree, I think, with these sloping branches, a coniferous tree. And I was wondering why that tree was there. It was kind of right in front of the door, doorstep of that, um, that, that ancient farm building. And I, I sort of, sort of thought, and maybe I'm entirely wrong here, but I thought maybe that tree had been planted there because the way the, the, the branches, branches are shaped uh, would, would uh, either hold the, the snow in place. And this was an area that gets a lot of snow, one or one and a half meters each winter or it would have um, um, pushed the snow away from, from the doorstep. Anyway, that was just a, th a thought I had and sort of looking at that tree, okay, someone decided that tree needed to be there. And then we were looking at other trees and we'd been doing that um, for a couple of days. And we slowly came to the realization that every tree was there because people had decided they wanted those trees to be there, either for, for food, for, uh, for shade, for, for cattle, uh, for fodder, for, um, uh, stabilizing slopes, uh, timber, uh, firewood, all these trees were there because people wanted them to be there. And then we looked at the rocks and, and every rock that feasibly could have been moved, uh, including some very, very large ones, had been moved over thousands of years by people and deciding, uh, decide, they, who decided that they didn't want those rocks in those fields, but we move them over there either to build houses or walls or just put them on big piles. And as we sort of analyze that landscape, I, I realized that apart from the mountains, everything had been made and decided by, uh, by people. And um, yeah, I had a really strong feel of, of how, how incredibly influential people have been in an area that of course still has wonderful ecological processes. And as I said, like some, like some top um, predator bears and wolves coming back. So, Clearly, these, these highly anthropogenic landscapes still had a lot of value for, for wildlife. Now, this is, of course, the picture that we have for Europe. We're used to that. We know that much of Europe has, Europe has, been, has lost a lot of its original uh, wilderness values and so on. Um, but in a place like Borneo, where I operate, we, we tend to think that that's all different, that Borneo is like pristine, untouched rainforest until, of course, sort of in the 1970s, people started to um, commercially open up the forest and then you got the big wave of deforestation and we lost a lot of that forest. 
And to a certain extent, of course, that is true. I mean, Bor Borneo is a lot wilder than much of Europe. Um, but we tend to forget that people have had a fundamental influence there as well. Um, this is a, a photo my, my wife took from a, um, uh, during a helicopter trip, which is probably the most isolated village in, uh, in Borneo. It's, it's way upriver, um, up the main river for several days travel, and then it's another couple of days on a small boat, small river, until you get to this village. And you can see in the photo that that village, it's, it's, a, it's a couple of a handful of houses. Um, they've, they've made some changes in the landscape. They've opened up some forests. There's probably fruit gardens there. There's some, some new uh, opening uh, openings in the forest further up on the top, um, but relatively little impact. That's sort of what it looks like. Then I was looking at a map dating back to 1870, and I realized where there's currently one village there were seven or eight, um, it's sort of, it doesn't really matter where it is on that map, but trust me, um, there were seven or eight villages 150 years ago. And you realize that a lot of these pristine sort of heart of Borneo, untouched natural areas have had long impact of, of people. And of course they wouldn't cut down all the forests, but they have had fundamental impacts on the wildlife of these um, uh, these, these places. And it's well known from the anthropological literature that um, entire tribes would settle in, in a watershed and, and establish all their villages and live there for two or three centuries, depleting the resources and the wildlife to the extent that the whole tribe would pack up, move all the villages to another watershed um, and, and allow that uh, older watershed, the previous watershed, to, to recover. So it isn't quite as pristine as we, we make it out to be. So um, this background is, is an entry point to these conservation paths. Um, I will, as I said, I'll talk about myself because I am that armchair scientist who measures orangutan skulls and does taxonomy. And, uh, and I do a lot more looking at conservation, looking at uh, species behavior, looking at the economics, looking at the social values of conservation and so on. And I'm also going to talk about uh, Roy Dennis. Um, why Roy Dennis? Um, I don't know whether you know Roy, but Roy's been in the uh, the newspapers a lot uh, recently. He is um, he's one of the uh, uh, he's a very well known um, uh, British conservationist. He's also my father-in-law, so anything I'm going to say about him um, that uh, that he's not going to like, I'm sure we'll we'll sort it out over a bottle of wine and a good dinner at some some later stage. But I also wanted to uh, to talk about Roy uh, firstly because I hugely admire his work as a a very hands-on conservationist who from a very early age started working with, with animals, mostly birds, but everything really. And he's got this really strong feel for, I guess traditionally it's called natural history, this, this interaction between, um, between species, species ecologies, the environment in which these species operate, uh, the, the way these species interact with each other, uh, the way these species are influenced by, by people and so on how that also relates to the, the geology and the soils, like this whole sort of holistic understanding of how nature operates in places like the, the British Isles. And he's been playing in that area for, for over 60 years, doing hands-on conservation work. Um, he, he's been um, very, very active with the reintroduction of the osprey, um, that, that were basically extinct in the UK, down to one non-breeding pair in the 1950s, and probably over 300 breeding pairs um, to, today. Um, been in the news recently about uh, reintroducing white-tailed eagle to the Isle of Wight, um, but th these are ongoing and long, long-term programs that started in Scotland, bringing white-tailed eagles from uh, from Norway, if I'm not mistaken, um, red squirrels, um, beavers, uh, a range of other species. Very active also, um, he, he's published two books last year, um, Cotton Grass Summer is a lovely book of, um, uh, of short, uh, short stories about nature, uh, very nicely written. I'm, I'm currently reading the second book, Restoring the Wild, uh, that talks about the details of all these reintroductions and translocations of wildlife from a place where they were relatively abundant to um, the UK. Uh, and then also onward from the UK, I think he's been releasing birds in Spain and Switzerland and, and so on. Um, so Roy is very much a natural historian and he's not particularly keen on scientists. Uh, in a, there was a quote recently in a Guardian article uh, 
in which he said, well, science is also evoked to stop conservation action. And I think Roy has got a point there. And this is something I think we need to be very careful about as, as conservation scientists, that we're operating in these complex systems where we'll never have the answer. Okay, let's introduce the beaver to, to the UK. Oh, no, you can't do that because beavers eat salmon. That's one of the, the, the worries that people had. Well, that doesn't take that much research to show that rodents don't eat um, um, salmon. Um, but then the next question comes up and say, well, but they're going to cause a lot of flooding. It's going to damage agricultural lands and so on and so on. And people just, oh, well, then we need to do a little bit more research and find it out. And I can sort of see the frustration that once you take the beaver back and just get on with it, uh, rather than having all this science, just putting up more obstacles for not doing it. And that I think that's a fair point. Now, the context in which Roy works is different from the context in, in, in which I work. And I think it's important uh, when we're talking about species translocation. I, the title of my, my uh, presentation is about moving the dilemmas around moving orangutans. So Roy uh, works in the British Isles primarily, um, which was uh, at some stage part of the, um, uh, the European continent. Uh, I guess the, the whole Brexit discussion wouldn't have been necessary at the time. Um, but it also meant that wildlife moved um, from, as, as the ice packs re, uh, retreated, from Europe into um, what are now the British Isles. And you basically had a European fauna that when it became an island and island faunas and floras go extinct much more quickly, um, largely became extinct. So a lot of species disappeared from the British Isles that, that still occur on the European mainland, also because of the impacts of deforestation between 1000 BC here and 1500 AD, uh, the British Isles lost much of their forest as did, did much of um, uh, the rest of, of Europe. So highly depleted ecological conditions where people are sort of become used to not having wildlife, not having wild boar, um, wild boar in your in your garden. And actually the wild boar is one that baffles me because um, I've, I've worked a lot on wild boar and I've worked with um, like people in Australia trying to eradicate wild boar because they are um, quite a damaging, ecologically damaging species. And pretty much everyone has given up. You just simply cannot eradicate wild boar. They, they're just they're too smart. They breed too fast. They, you just can't, can't get rid of them unless they're on a small island. Well, somehow the Brits managed um, to eradicate them from the entire British Isles, which is quite astonishing. And it's still a question that I haven't uh, got a clear answer for. I, I guess a lot of people with a lot of uh, bow and arrows chasing after those wild wild boars. Um, it's it's quite it's quite interesting. Um, anyway, those those a lot of those species um, uh, disappeared. So Roy's then been bringing back uh, these species, and people are really quite surprised that um, species like white-tailed -tailed eagle are doing really quite well in. Uh, parts of the of Britain that are um, dominated by by people and have like high high intensity agriculture. Um, one of the white tip eagles um, uh, released in the Isle of Wight was seen flying over towards London and then made a little circle over Big Ben and then flew flew back again, uh, just to checking things out. And I think it's it's an interesting realization that a lot of these species can actually cope with a lot of uh, human interference and, and human influence as long as we don't kill them and there is enough to eat for them and shelter to uh, to breed. And that's a, a lesson that I guess we're, we're learning in places like the UK, but it's also a lesson that we're very much learning in uh, places like uh, like Borneo. So that was Roy. Um, so uh, myself, I, um, I'm very much a scientist, um, um, not an academic. I've never worked for at a university. Um, but I approach things very scientifically, but always in <laughs> keeping in mind of um, trying to work out how do you translate these scientific insights into things that influence conservation practice. So it's really on that interface between science and practice that I um, uh, that I that I operate, including using using science to change policies, uh, public opinion. Uh, Bob just mentioned the the newspaper articles that I certainly used to write and um, not as frequently anymore as I used to, uh, but, but using science very much with an objective to change conservation outcomes. Uh, mostly working on uh, initially on orangutans <coughs> and then um, going into 
more controversial topics like the the value of timber concessions for uh, for wildlife. <coughs> Excuse me. And even more recently, um, the value of uh, and the threat of oil palm for for biodiversity. So my contacts in which I work is uh, the island of Borneo, that, as I said earlier, uh, was still forest, largely forest covered in the 1970s. And as I worked there in the early 90s, you could see the forest retreating, especially from uh, from the lowland areas, uh, being uh, displaced to to some extent by industrial scale plantations for pulp and paper and palm oil production, which are here on that um, that map uh, depicted in in black. Um, so rapid deforestation, um, but it's a little bit of a question for me, and I've always said this, is, is the, the cup half empty or half full? Uh, people talk about the massive deforestation on Borneo, which is absolutely uh, true and, and, um, and from an ecological perspective, highly, highly shocking and worrying. But uh, you can also turn things around and say, well, Borneo's got uh, nearly 50% of its forest cover left. And that forest cover is, is, is stabilizing. The forest loss on Borneo in the past few years, or really since 2010, 2011, has, um, has stabilized. Deforestation has much, been much reduced. So I'm looking towards a future where that core, that green area that you see here in that map for 2017, is largely stable. And my concerns are what is happening in that area where there is a lot of agriculture, but there's a lot of patches of forest uh, with species like orangutan. So in fact, uh, some of the, the scientists here at, um, uh, at DICE, Maria Voigt and Dave Seaman are doing a lot of work on, uh, on a species like orangutan, moving and, and surviving in these fragmented landscapes, trying to understand how that works. Because we know, um, we have this idea that orangutans are species of primary rainforest. Um, well, they're, they're, they're actually doing really quite well in, uh, for example, selectively logged timber concessions. Um, they're also surviving in monocultural plantation. I would never call an oil palm plantation an ideal orangutan habitat, but they're surviving there and they're surviving in the natural forest patches that are left within that matrix of, of oil palm, especially females. Females don't like to move. They sit there and the males, once palms grow up, travel through the, through the oil palm landscape, visit the females. And um, in, in uh, Northern Borneo, in Sabah, um, females have been followed or patches have been followed that have had female re producing young for several decades. In situations where our normal population viability thinking would say, no way can these animals survive because that patch is just uh, way too small. Uh, one, one animal doesn't make a population. So the normal thing is what we do is we pick up those animals, you can't survive, we take you away and we put you somewhere in that center of Borneo safely into a population. Forgetting, and this is happening a lot, uh, orangutans are probably one of the most translocated species in, uh, in the world. Um, um, we, we know of 621 orangutans that were translocated over a 10 year period, but we think that's quite an underestimate, especially when oil palm was being opened up. I think there were a lot of movements of animals that are sort of um, sort of seen as, as, as positive. People forget that there is a couple of very worrying um, um, aspects of, of that moving of orangutans. First of all, um, mortality rates of orangutans that are being translocated are probably very high estimates range between 20 and 80 percent but they're rarely rarely followed so we don't have any data on this what happens after an orangutan with an orangutan after you take it out of its home patch and move it into a larger forest area now orangutan specialists and i won't name names have told me um, that especially with adult males taking an adult male from its home and moving it into a larger forest area um, is, is going to lead to, uh, to either of two things. He's going to pick a fight with the resident um, dominant male and he's going to win that fight um, and displace that male who then needs to get out and move into the agricultural area or he gets displaced and needs to move out. And orangutans have actually been rescued from small forest patches taken over long distance to a national park only to be found several years later in that same patch being killed um, by oil palm workers. So um, as, as this um, orangutan specialist said, uh, moving adult males um, is, is 
is useless. You might as well shoot them on the spot. Literally, uh, his words. And um, female orangutans apparently are similarly problematic. Now, this is sad for the individual orangutan. What my concern is that not just individual orangutans are dying in this process, but as we learn more about the metapopulation dynamics of these orangutans that survive in patches, move between larger forest patches, basically in a connected metapopulation, once we start taking away all these small patches, your metapopulation structure starts falling apart and your viability of the overall population goes down. So there, there are real concerns, ecological concerns of this approach, which is really quite different from translocations in the, the British context where species are being taken back because they are basically extinct from areas where they're abundant to repopulate some of these areas. Um, now, those are two major concerns, high mortality rates, undermining of metapopulation dynamics. But probably my, my key concern with translocations is that it shapes up this perspective among uh, rural farmers, communities, uh, the government, that conservation is something that we can just safely move out of the way if it's in the way of our development wishes. Um, there is a, an alarm number you can call, a government number. You've got an orangutan in your garden, garden that's bothering you, that's eating your fruit. Just call the number and we'll come and pick up and take the orangutan away. That, that is not conservation. That, that is anti-conservation as far as I'm concerned. And I understand that sometimes there is no choice because otherwise that orangutan will be killed. But I'm calling on practitioners to start rethinking these, these kind of strategies because ultimately we need to go to, to a situation where people and orangutans can quite safely and happily live together. And this is not uh, helping very well. Now, what, what baffles me um, in this discussion is, uh, and I, I just um, took a photograph, uh, I was in the ne Netherlands last week, uh, and I was uh, reading a, um, one of the, the popular um, nature conservation magazines that mil millions of people subscribe to, and saw these two lovely pages of, uh, on the bottom, the agricultural landscape that typifies the Netherlands at the moment. Um, uh, heavily managed uh, monocultures of a particular grass or, or crop, uh, heavily, heavy use of pesticides, um, fertilizer, a runoff of fertilizer into the aquatic system, um, grass that's being cut too early so um, um, birds that breed in these grasslands can't raise their young or the young are killed when the uh, the mowers come in. Anyway, uh, not a good system for biodiversity and there, therefore low biodiversity values. Um, and I and I see a slow movement, and, and I think this is increasingly common in, in, in Europe, um, of, of, of starting to rethink agriculture uh, where production and production value is not the only thing we're targeting, but we're also targeting ecological value um, social value, um, aesthetics, ethics, pers 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 perspectives, what people think towards a much more diverse kind of landscape where production is sacrificed, but there's gains for, um, for many biodiversity aspects and aesthetic aspects of, of the landscape. And this is, this is being experimented with uh, in many places in, in Europe. Um, now, the funny thing is, while this is quite accepted in the uh, European context, when I talk about this in the oil palm context, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm not too worried about the core area of forest in Borneo. I don't, this is quite mountainous, um, few opportunities for plantations. I think that will be relatively stable. My concern are with that kind of multifunctional landscape where you have agriculture, where countries like Indonesia and Malaysia earn revenues, where farmers earn income to send their kids to school and all these things that we want in sustainable development. Um, but they're also um, biodiversity values. And if I talk about biodiversity value in palm oil, I just get slaughtered on, on, um, on social media. People get very aggressive. How dare you? Palm oil is the evil. You shouldn't be talking about it in relation to biodiversity because the two are simply incompatible. Um, quite weird that you have these two very different viewpoints on, on something that is fundamentally the same idea that a lot of agricultural landscape have value, can have value for biodiversity, depending on how you manage them. Now, in, in oil palm quite often, and last year I visited um, five really well-managed um, palm oil concessions in Brazil and uh, Malaysia and Indonesia. 
where companies really were really investing uh, quite heavily. I, I visited a company in um, in Brazil, a uh, large company, 100,000 hectares. That, that's huge. But 60% of that, um, right in the middle of the of the Amazon forest, 60% of that was uh, protected forest, uh, patrolled forest, where um, two species, at least at least two species, occurred that hadn't been seen anywhere else in in Amazonia because they were. Uh, high in demand for uh, for the cage uh, cage bird trade, and it simply disappeared. Apart from that, uh, that oil palm concession, and that that simply is to do with management. Um, these companies that I visited spend between six and fifty U.S. dollars per hectare per year, which is a lot higher than the average protected area spending in developing countries by one or two orders of magnitude. So it's not that surprising that some of these companies that do take conservation seriously can have positive conservation outcomes. Uh, I've myself worked with a palm oil company in, in um, West Kalimantan in Indonesia, who now have a population of probably between 150 or two and 200 orangutans within the forest areas that they are protecting. And these are forest areas that are highly threatened by, by fires. And I can almost guarantee that without the management of that palm oil company, those forest areas and those orangutans would no longer exist. Now, the same company has also cut down forest and has had a negative impact on orangutans, but it's it's playing with that balance. What can we do? And what, what are what are some of these ideal kind of contexts of, of producing the commodities that the world is asking uh, while addressing at the same time some of these crucial biodiversity decline and climatic change challenges that we're, we're, we're facing. And on top of that, there's all these other social agendas of, of alleviating poverty and education uh, that needs to be improved and so on. So again, a highly complex um, situation where I'm working a lot on op trying to optimize, trying to think what optimal land use would look like across the tropics or globally for meeting the demands that we have for, um, for commodities and um, and, and stuff we eat and so on. And that's not, not easy. And again, there's a lot of different and strong opinions about it, because if your concern is just with orangutans and you don't care about what small farmers sort of earn with, with palm oil, then the world is easy. And of course you are against palm oil and you'd say ban it. It gets a lot more complicated once you start thinking these things through and say, well, okay, there is still a demand for oil. If it doesn't come from palm oil, it's going to come from something else. And we move into the problem somewhere else. Um, I don't really have the space to talk about this in detail, but I think it's a really important question that um, we, we do need to address. Now, so I'm that armchair um, scientist and I, I still want to be influential. So how, how do you do that? What kind of science doesn't hinder conservation as in the case of, of Roy sometimes finding that conservation stands in the way of just getting on with things and, and things that are really urgently needed to, to strengthen the ecological resilience and versatility of, of places like, um, like the British Isles. Um, how do you make science, science useful? Now, I wanted to, to uh, talk about one, one example, um, the Tapanuli orangutan, um, a species I, I rediscovered or I discovered in, in 1997. It took us 20 years to recognize that it was uh, distinct from the other Sumatran orangutan, potentially even closer related to the orangutan in Borneo, but these lineages separated millions of years ago. Uh, so it was, it became a new species, uh, quite, quite distinct. It lives in a small area. It's the most threatened great ape species in the world. There is fewer than 800 left in the world, which we now realize uh, when we, <laughs> when we uh, found out it was a distinct species. Uh, right through that retaining the remaining habitat, which that is that um, red area on the on the map, um, uh, which is on, on, a, on a mountain. So these are thought to be highland orangutans. Um, right through that habitat, uh, there are plans to develop a, a hydro dam that would, uh, with all the infrastructure and the disturbance, pretty much um, split that remaining population of 800 animals into three distinct population. And it, it doesn't take genius thinking to uh, to conclude that this is not going to be good for the survival of the Tapanuli orangutan. Now, I find that really important. As I said, the greatest, um, the, the most endangered great ape species in the world. And I think we need to be very careful 
in, in what we do. So here we're using signs to say, well, hold on, let's just, can we just wait with this dam a little longer? And this is very much supported by the IUCN who, who called for a moratorium on, on dam development until we understood the signs. So here things again are holding up development, but I think from a positive perspective, at least if you like orangutans. Now, some of the signs that we did is we, uh, I dug through the his history, the historical literature going back to uh, 18th century old colonial uh, literature, trying to work out was that species that sits, that Tapanuli orangutan that sits on this mountain area, um, was it always just there or was it much more widely distributed? As it turns out, based on, on this information, we think that the current habitat of the Tapanuli orangutan is about two and a half percent of the habitat it had in 1819, uh, 1880, so about 130, 140 years ago. So a massive decline driven by fragmentation and probably unsustainable hunting. And the only reason this orangutan sits at quite high elevation in these hill forests is not because it likes it there, but because it's not been hunted uh, to extinction there. And I think this concept of refuge species where we look and Roy writes about that um, similarly about golden eagle in, 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 in Scotland that were always sitting like very isolated parts of the Scottish Highlands and until he saw them in, 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 um, in Sweden and they were flying over these well forested fertile um, areas and you realize what we're looking at in Scotland is not because that bird wants to be there but it's the only place we haven't killed them yet um, and I think the same with orangutans and these are important insights that we're using very effectively. This is a big like 1.6 billion US dollar project that's been going for years. The IFC, the International Finance Corporation looked into funding it, they, they withdrew. Asian Devel Development Bank had a look at it. Then the Bank of China showed a real interest and even they withdrew because of concerns about this, this great aid. Now, we're not done yet. Um, the Indonesian government and the company, of course, are very keen to push this ahead strong feelings of national rights for development and so on. So the fight continues, but I think it's, an, it's a good example of cleverly using science to, to say, no, hold on, can we be responsible here? Can we at least understand what the impacts are and potentially change this project that makes it more compatible with the objectives of conser conservation as well as other things, because it is all about green energy, of course, and, um, and, and again, you're talking about complex trade-offs and potential synergies. So I don't think there are any silver bullets in conservation. And um, I see this a lot on the discourse, again, on social media, where people think they have the answer to everything. No, conservation often is very complex. Um, and, and your simple answers to a lot of these complex problems, unfortunately, are often wrong. And this is something we need to, to play with and, and, and realize, okay, well, what, what are, um, in my example of the Tapanuli orangutan, maybe some of these simple answers can be effective because it stops a certain development. Um, but I think overall, we're looking at complex situations where there's a lot of values at play and finding that balance of how you move about in that uh, conservation context can be really challenging. So um, if you're, an aspiring conservation scientist hoping to be um, influential somewhere um, or you're just interested in conservation and want to understand science and, and the role science can play, um, what, what are some of my take-home messages, some, some of the generalities that I've picked up and that I both sort of recognize in my own work, I also recognize it in, in the work that Roy Dennis has done, I recognize it in the work of a lot of effective conservation people in general, those that are willing to stick out their neck uh, and take individual leadership over particular cases or species or contexts, those are the ones that are driving change. Conservation, of course, is often in the hands of larger organizations and governments and policies and, and bureaucracies. That's where change occurs, but it changes very slowly. I think the big jumps towards real success often come, come from individuals who are just unwilling to say, no or take no for an answer. Um, I think in that scientists can provide um, badly needed nuance in these, these often black and white debates where people jump to simple conclusions because they often don't have the information about the complexity of the systems in which they, um, they operate. Um, and that context really determines um, what's going to work and what doesn't and how we're going to operate it. So again, 
it is complex and silver bullets do not exist. And I think uh, I took this quote from uh, from Roy, uh, Roy's book on uh, uh, restoring the wild. It's it's um, it's a bit of an understatement where he says tenacity and a long view to the to the future are important in wildlife conservation. I think they are really crucial. They're more than important. They're crucial. Just hang in there. Don't give up uh, and keep fighting and try to be strategic in in how you combine your 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 hands on knowledge, your scientific insights, your advocacy opportunities to drive for change towards uh, better management of biodiversity and a nicer world to uh, to live in. So I think that's um, that's my uh, conversation about conservation today. Um, feel free to, to ask me questions, happy to uh, discuss or pop me an email at um, email at bonyafutures.org. Thank you very much for your attention.